What is this channel and what is not is very simple. Listen and learn at every moment of your life. And one more thing. So what is this? Yes, it's a simple slogan. Welcome to my world. I hope you enjoy this narrative. What men live by, writer Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy. What men live by, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not abideth in death. The first epistle St. John, chapter 3, 14. Whose hath the world's goods, and beholdeth his brother in need, and shutteth up his compassion from him? How doth the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither with the tongue, but in deed and truth. Chapter 3, 17 to 18. Love is of God, and every that loveth is begotten of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Chapter 4, 7 to 8. No man hath beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abideth in us. Chapter 4, 12. God is love, and he that abideth in love abideth in God, and God abideth in him. Chapter 4, 16. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Chapter 4, 20. A shoemaker named Simon, who had neither house nor land of his own, lived with his wife and children in a peasant's hut, and earned his living by his work. Work was cheap, but bread was dear, and what he earned he spent for food. The man and his wife had but one sheepskin coat between them for winter wear, and even that was torn to tatters, and this was the second year he had been wanting to buy sheepskins for a new coat. Before Wyatter, Simon saved up a little money. A three-ruble note lay hidden in his wife's box, and five rubles and twenty kopecks were owed him by customers in the village. So one morning, he prepared to go to the village to buy the sheepskins. He put on over his shirt his wife's wadded nankeen jacket, and over that he put his own cloth coat. He took the three-ruble note in his pocket, cut himself a stick to serve as a staff, and started off after breakfast. I'll collect the five rubles that are due to me, thought he, at the three I have got, and that will be enough to buy sheepskins for the winter coat. He came to the village and called at a peasant's hut, but the man was not at home. The peasant's wife promised that the money should be paid next week, but she would not pay it herself. Then Simon called on another peasant, but this one swore he had no money and would only pay 20 kopecks which he owed for a pair of boots Simon had mended. Simon then tried to buy the sheep skins on credit, but the dealer would not trust him. Bring your money, said he, then you may have your pick of the skins. We know what debt collecting is like. So all the business the shoemaker did was to get the 20 kopecks for boots he had mended, and to take a pair of felt boots a peasant gave him to sole with leather. Simon felt downhearted. He spent the 20 kopecks on vodka and started homewards without having bought any skins. In the morning he had felt the frost, but now, after drinking the vodka, he felt warm, even without a sheepskin coat. He trudged along, striking his stick on the frozen earth with one hand, swinging the felt boots with the other and talking to himself. One, I'm quite warm, said he, though I have no sheepskin coat. I've had a drop and it runs through all my veins. I need no sheepskins. I go along and don't worry about anything. That's the sort of man I am. What do I care? I can live without sheepskins. I don't need them. My wife will fret, to be sure, and true enough, it is a shame. One works all day long and then does not get paid. Stop a bit. If you don't bring that money along, sure enough, I skin you, blessed if I don't. How's that? He pays 20 kopecks at a time. What can I do with 20 kopecks? Drink it. That's all one can do. Hard up, he says, lie is. So he may be. But what about me? You have a house and cattle and everything. I've only what I stand up in. 
You have corn of your own growing. I have to buy every grain. Do what I will. I must spend three rubles every week for bread alone. I come home and find the bread are used up, and I have to fork out another ruble and a half, so just pay up what you owe, and no nonsense about it. By this time, he had nearly reached the shrine at the bend of the road. Looking up, he saw something whitish behind the shrine. The daylight was fading, and the shoemaker peered at the thing without being able to make out what it was. There was no white stone here before. Can it be an ox? It's not like an ox. It has a head like a man, but it's too white. And what could a man be doing there? He came closer, so that it was clearly visible. To his surprise, it really was a man, alive or dead, sitting naked, leaning motionless against the shrine. Terror seized the shoemaker, and he thought, someone has killed him, stripped him, and left him there. If I meddle, I shall surely get into trouble. So the shoemaker went on. He passed in front of the shrine so that he could not see the man. When he had gone some way, he looked back and saw that the man was no longer leaning against the shrine, but was moving as if looking towards him. The shoemaker felt more frightened than before and thought, shall I go back to him or shall I go on? If I go near him, something dreadful may happen. Who knows who the fellow is? He has not come here for any good. If I go near him, he may jump up and throttle me, and there will be no getting away. Or if not, he'd still be a burden on one's hands. What could I do with a naked man? I couldn't give him my last clothes. Heaven only helped me to get away. So the shoemaker hurried on, leaving the shrine behind him, when suddenly his conscience smote him, and he stopped in the road. What are you doing, Simon, said he to himself. The man may be jong of want, and you slip past afraid. Have you grown so rich as to be afraid of robbers? Ah, Simon, shame on you. So he turned back and went up to the man. Two. Simon approached the stranger, looked at him and saw that he was a young man, fit, with no bruises on his body, only evidently freezing and frightened. And he sat there leaning back without looking up at Simon, as if too faint to lift his eyes. Simon went close to him and then the man seemed to wake up. Turning his head, he opened his eyes and looked into Simon's face. That one look was enough to make Simon fond of the man. He threw the felt boots on the ground, undid his sash, laid it on the boots and took off his cloth coat. It's not a time for talking, said he. Come, put this coat on at once. And Simon took the man by the elbows and helped him to rise. As he stood there, Simon saw that his body was clean and in good condition, his hands and feet shapely, and his face good and kind. He threw his coat over the man's shoulders, but the latter could not find the sleeves. Simon guided his arms into them, and drawing the coat well on, wrapped it closely about him, tying the sash round the man's waist. Simon even took off his torn cap to put it on the man's head, but then his own head felt cold, and he thought, I'm quite bald, while he has long curly hair. So he put his cap on his own head again. It will be better to give him something for his feet, thought he. And he made the man sit down and helped him to put on the felt boots, saying, There, friend, now move about and warm yourself. Other matters can be settled later on. Can you walk? The man stood up and looked kindly at Simon, but could not say a word. Why don't you speak, said Simon. It's too cold to stay here. We must be getting home. There now, take my stick, and if you're feeling weak, lean on that. Now step out. The man started walking and moved easily, not lagging behind. As they went along, Simon asked him, And where do you belong to? I'm not from these parts. I thought as much. I know the folks hereabouts, but how did you come to be there by the shrine? I cannot tell. Has someone been ill-treating you? No one has ill-treated me. God has punished me. Of course, GBD rules all. Still, you'll have to find food and shelter somewhere. Where do you want to go to? It is all the same to me. Simon was amazed. The man did not look like a rogue and he spoke gently, but yet 
he gave no account of himself. Still, Simon thought, who knows what may have happened? And he said to the stranger, well then, come home with me and at least warm yourself a while. So Simon walked towards his home and the stranger kept up with him walking at his side. The wind had risen and Simon felt it cold under his shirt. He was getting over his tip sinus by now and began to feel the frost. He went along sniffling and wrapping his wife's coat round him and he thought to himself, there now, talk about sheepskins. I went out for sheepskins and come home without even a coat to my back. And what is more, I'm bringing a naked man along with me. Matriona won't be pleased. And when he thought of his wife, he felt sad. But when he looked at the stranger and remembered how he had looked up at him at the shrine, his heart was glad. 3. Simon's wife had everything ready early that day. She had cut wood brought water, fed the children, eaten her own meal, and now she sat thinking. She wondered when she ought to make bread, now or tomorrow. There was Stayu, a large piece left. If Simon has had some dinner in town, thought she, and does not eat much for supper, the bread will last out another day. She weighed the piece of bread in her hand again and again, and thought, I won't make any more today. We have only enough flour left to bake one batch. We can manage to make this last out till Friday.